So, today, we're gonna be doing some cutting. And, spin you around here. If I can swap the camera around, there we go. There we are. Need to get the light on here a bit better. There we are. All right. So these are the stones I've picked out for today. Got a couple here from Cooper Opal. I like this camera better when it's just filming. The uh, quality is much better. But yeah, so some really nice material here. It's got a bit of a milky patch there, but the bar ducks under that. So we'll take that off. And uh, a couple of bits of matrix from Andamuka. Just gonna slice through there. Get a stone out of there somewhere. That'll probably get treated in the end. More bits of matrix. Hopefully it looks stunning once they're treated. And some more Andamuka. So you can see Andamuka, Cubipedi, they both have white opal, or light opal. as well as the crystals and blacks. But yeah, so how is everyone this morning? Chat on. Live chat, there we go. G'day Jack and Stephen. Yeah, not too bad mate, yeah. Early morning, I thought I'd try and get an early one done. That way, other people around the world get to see it at different times. I might even continue this on later this afternoon with the carving. I'm in the mood today. A <laughs> um, couple of bits of mint to be here too. Uh, those two bits. These were for a friend. These are the ones I cut the doublets out of. Uh, perfect timing. G'day first, last. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are meant to be. So these have issue issues uh, with fractures. It's uh, probably a bit hard to see. Where are we? Yeah, there's a couple of tiny fractures in amongst it, which I can get around, I think. And try and get a half decent stone out of sorry about the camera here a bit wobbly so yeah you might be able to get half half decent stones out of them but these are more of a uh, prosperity cut these are for someone whose father had found these so i'm just going to try and get as much of a stone out of them as possible so that's those two. Oh, and this one this one looks really interesting. This red runs all the way through there. Comes out the back here. This little blob's full of colour. Might have to slice it up, unfortunately. Be a great little carving, but it does have fracture marks as well. This is that stuff that got hit with a grater blade. <laughs> um. What else we got here? Yeah, these are some rubs I'd started. These are some Matrix, my mining partner. So I thought I'd finish them off while I'm here. They've got to be treated yet. But they need to be uh, properly shaped. A couple of bits of crystal here. Get some nice little stones out of, hopefully. Be very small, little ring stones. Um, 
yeah, a couple of bits of the matrix, as I said. They sort of came off of each other, I think. And what else have we got here? This is a bit, all I can see is from there. It's got a red bar and a green bar and a blue bar up top. Traffic lights, no. Um, and I'm pretty sure it does go fair way into there, so I'm keen to see what's inside under here. So I've just picked a few bits out that I'm keen to have a look into. It's a bit of uh, Andamuka. It's got a touch of black on it. <laughs> Don't think that's gonna turn it black or anything though for this one. And uh, yeah, that's what I've got going on. Something else I wanna quickly show you, so I'm just gonna quickly grab. Just hang on a sec. So <clears throat> I'm doing the treating with the concrete matrix and I actually found it does take quite a good polish. That's not got any resin on it at all. So I'm gonna try some without resin as well and see what they come up like. Uh, I've got one on the way with the resin. I did, uh, so I did a video and then I sort of gave it another coating so I've sort of ruined it again. It did look all right, but I gave it a thicker coating. Um, it's got glue all over it. It looks horrible, but when this stuff polishes up, which it does all right, um, it's not too bad. But <laughs> this is super glue. So I'll just give it a go while the other stuff's. I'm waiting on some Starbond Thin, and I've got the other uh, resins waiting to go. But yeah, doing the treatment. So I'm going to clean this one up, show you what that comes up like. But yeah, did a couple like this with a natural polish. I'm going to see how that goes once they're treated. It's got some really nice colour all the way over. So much more than you can see through the camera too. And once that's treated, I'm pretty sure it will come up really, really nice. So yeah, that's a bit of an update on the uh, resin coating. Um, I'm hoping to get the star bond in before where are we? Before next week before I head back off to Andamuka and um, yeah get a few coats on it. The um, difference between star bond and the other resins I'm learning is star bond will actually soak in a little bit better to um, stabilize the stone and then instead of trying to peel off afterwards if you try and get a polish on it, uh, it won't lift, it'll just stay put and then you just bring the surface down. Um, with that super glue to start with, if it doesn't totally coat it and you've got a hole anywhere into the stone, it'll start peeling and lifting and waste of effort. So yeah, you've got to get it totally sealed if I'm going to use resins, which is why I'd like to use the vacuum chamber, purge all the bubbles and get all the gaps out. But I'm pretty sure Starbond's the way to go from what I'm hearing. So. Yeah, just kind of waiting to get hold of that and yeah, see how that goes. Yes, you can use that for pretty much all opal. Um, that's porous enough to absorb something, otherwise it will just sit on the surface. Um, plus the glassy stuff, there's no need for it anyway, it polishes. <laughs> but yeah, you can use that for fairy matrix, boulder opal, uh, Andamuka matrixes and yeah, I've looked at some matrix and I'm like, oh, that looks pretty glassy. And you just can't tell that there's a resin on it. It's a really high polish finish and I was impressed with it. And I'm like, I hope I can get that result. So dabbling in the unknown a bit with the uh, concrete, but really pretty stuff. Can't wait to make a chessboard out of it. That's gonna be heaps good. But um, yeah, got a few things going on here at the moment. I've got some matrix in the acid. We'll have a look at that before I end this. I'll sort of pull a jar out and have a look, see how it's going. Uh, it's got to go in for three days. It's on its second day today. And uh, better get those ones into the um, Ribena. Actually, I might quickly do that now. Save a sec. Just drop these in the pot. start soaking but yeah so I'm going to quickly flip back around and just show you a couple more bits of this um, 
parcel that young fella called Petey April sent me. Firstly, thought I'd quickly show you, that's that pendant from the uh, last video. And that was cut by Cuba PD Opal. There's some really nice colour in there too. Get it on the right angle, got the light on the wrong side. Hold it up that way. There you go. Yeah. Hope his, uh, hope his mum likes it. He's uh, decided to put a gift together for her. So yeah, that's that. But yeah, other than these two bits, um, there's a couple more bits. G'day, Millie. How are you this morning? Well, my morning. This one's a little bit hard to see the colour on. It's actually all the way through, it's just got a bit of a skin. And yeah, this bit, I was thinking of doing it double sided. It's got a green bar there, which will be a nice little green face there, and then it's got a. It's going to come up too well. Bit of a red bar there on top. Multicolor bar. So I reckon that might be a nice little two sider. It's going to cut it either down the middle and make two stones out of it, but I thought, nah, double sider would be better. So I might save that one for a bit of a carving later this afternoon, too. Um. Got to get a few carvings done. So I like to sit down and just do the uh, main clean up and then slowly get through them. Yeah, g'day Paul, <laughs> yeah, you finally made it. Yeah, I decided to start this one early enough to give other people a chance. Um, as I was saying just then, I'll, I'll probably do a carving video a bit later this afternoon. <laughs> Almost bedtime. Oh no, I need to do one later at night. Um, yeah, I work all night hours, so as long as it's warm enough out here, I don't mind sitting out here um, and getting on with something. I enjoy this that much. It's, yeah, try and keep me out of it. <laughs> <coughs> um, but yeah, um, I might get the machine, start that going and start cleaning some of this up. Um, I've just got to get the water on and figure out a camera position. Um, let's go for a walk. Ugh. Put that up there. We'll switch around. Around about there, I reckon. Yep. So just give me a second, I'm just going to go turn this hose on. There we go. I might see if I can get a bit extra light. subject yeah. a bit better everyone hear me okay yeah no worries all right so we're going to start with I'll start with this one. Can you see how that's going to clear up under that foggy bit? Awesome. All right, grab me goggles. Yep. 
This is how I usually look when I'm cutting, <laughs> as close as I can. Scary movie. What was that close up? <laughs> All right. So here comes a bit of noise. I hope the noise isn't too bad. Let's turn that water up a bit. There we go. All right. Now this bit, as I was saying, has got a, uh, a bit of a foggy skin over the top here. But the colour bar runs all the way underneath it and all the way around. So I'm going to try and just touch that up a bit and see what comes out of it. Winter colour. Starting to come through a bit better. Here we go. It's not even right down yet, still a bit to go. I think this one's sort of been rubbed a little bit prior. And so we sort of ended up with this shape, which I've got to try and decide to do an oval, circle, or freeform. It's got some really nice color. I don't really want to waste any of it, but we have to do something with the shape. So I might have to take this side down a bit from this side because it's a bit um, wedge shaped from where I took this side down. So I'll just lean over this side of the stone a bit. Yeah, it evens it up a touch. So I'll do the sides and get rid of these chips, bring them in. Uh, I don't think I've cut from Whitecliffs yet. Uh, I may be wrong, but to my knowledge, I don't think I've cut from Whitecliffs. That'd be uh, some nice crystal that's coming out of there. Um, I wouldn't mind playing with. Um, a couple of the uh, boulder opal fields, I've, I've handled boulder opal, but um, there's, there's quite a few fields and I'm mainly Koroit, Quilpy sort of material, Yawa, but there are other fields I wouldn't mind getting some from. I'd love to get a collection up of something from each field and Lambina, I haven't got any Lambina material, which is as you go up north of Coopedia, you get to a town called Marla. If you turn left from Marley, you'll get to uh, Minterby. If you turn right, you'll go to Lambina. So I'll just take this little chip bit out. Right, so now I'm just going to give it a shape. It's almost in a bit of a teardrop with a wider base down here and a, a narrower top, like an Easter egg or a teardrop. So I might make it a drop shape, make this the top. Um, well, it does face better up that way. And that's the thing with opal, you're trying to get the best face for when the setter sets in um, jewellery. So you've got to try and orientate the stone the way it's going to sit if you're not going to 
um, you know, if you're cutting it in a circle, you, you can't lose really because you could put it in any position. But once you cut a shape, it's got to go a certain way up. And if it faces best like that, and then you go and set it up that way or cut it that way, it has to be set that way and you won't get the best flash. So we've got to try and make that somehow the right way up. So we may actually lose a bit here. So that way and that way. Yeah, I reckon that way is the best orientation. So I might go for a circle. I might just bring this round here in. And when I'm looking for a shape, I'm looking for a shape that gives it minimal loss. I don't want to go cutting an oval and then having to bring the sides right in to make the oval. Uh, probably rounded. I could go cushion, but then I'd be taking more off than I would with a round. Um, and it's got this little dip down here, but it sits right above the color bar, so I should be able to roll that out. But also got to just make sure the color bar is thick enough all the way around, which it is. Still a bit of a chip there. As long as I get the side up to the bottom of the colour bar, the rest can be rounded over. Coming into shape, I'm trying to just go slow and use minimal loss. This will be a freehand, freeform circle, by the way. Um, you can draw templates and go for it. Um, but once this gets on the stick centrally and starts doing the rounds, I'll, uh, it, it will come out pretty perfect anyway. in that's almost ready for the dop stick So being around that way can be on, oriented in any which way it wants to be. So depending on a ring or a, that's a bit big for a ring stone, but ring or a pendant stone, um, yeah, it can spin around to whichever way suits the setter to set it. Can't wait to see the color right up here. It's still got a skin over it.
I'll save the rest of that for a dop stick. All right, a bit more control. All right. <coughs> Might just quickly neaten this bit up too and see what's going to be left of it, hopefully enough. Being a wide opal, a bit hard to film, but that's all pinkish down this end. Just gonna go turn the water up for a sec, guys. There we go. Every now and then my water pressure drops because I do it controlled by the hose outside. There's a control on the side of the machine, but it can overload and burst and I'd rather not risk it. There we go. First drop for the morning. This one's got to even up this side a bit, so it's got a bit to come off yet. Starting to look a bit better, there we go. Still got a bit to come off this edge here, I reckon, to neaten it up. But I'll just start working the back, getting it down. It's a good reason I love this machine. You've got so much room to work on. Good day, Nobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, early morning this morning. Can't wait for daylight saving to start. That way the sun's already up. Get later at night as well. That'll do for that one at the moment. That can go on a stick. We should thin it out a little bit more. Yeah. 
Oh, another one from Cupid Opal. I'll just take this off and see what's underneath both sides. Starting to come through a bit. Try this side. Nice bit of stone down there. Really hoping that went through the other end. Still got it a bit there. I'm not sure it doesn't. I think it's a bit broken up in the middle though. Bit of a space. So it's a bit of opal this end, bit of opal this end. And the potch centre. But there's still a little, little stone in there. Hopefully get him out. I'll have to put it on the saw and cut through there. Get a little stone out. Hey, good morning, Grant. After boxing, ah, okay. What training or? The other one I want to get a look at. See what's under here. Take this side in a bit first. Okay. Did you win? <laughs> Morning, Antique. Antique. Okay. Hopefully that cleans up all right. Not sure if the bar is going to be thick enough, but we'll keep going. It's got a bit too much of this stuff in it. Good day, Kane. Glad you can make it. bit deep. Hmm. I don't want to lose that colour. G'day Roy. How are you this one? Yeah, might have to go small one there. Not sure what that hole's gonna do. I think the colour's running out down this end. 
Yeah, I'll give him a cut and see how he goes. Yeah, I did an early morning one. I thought uh, I might reach a few more people around the world. I'll take this top down. have to be an interesting looking bits of stone somewhere in there might even get an oval out of it it's all potched down here so I'll take that off Listen. There we go. Might be a triangle. Keep it even, take a bit off this. Um, a lot of over time. My first introduction to Opal was around about 1992. As a year 10 graduate, I did try year 11 a couple of times. On the second time, I did adult re-entry at Christie's Beach High, where a man, Don Rankin, was teaching opal cutting as a lesson, lapidary. Shanghai, how are you, Severo? And yeah, 1992 was where I learned how to cut, but <laughs> there you go. But um, it took me a while to get to understand what I'd learned and what I could do with it. So I'd gone and lived a whole bunch of life between uh, a lot of labouring jobs, you know, cash work, uh, interstate truck driving. Um, ended up in a joinery where I worked a fair while and, and learnt quite a bit. And it started dawning on me that once you learn how to sand and polish, you know, the only thing they say you can't polish is a turd. And I, I'd, I'd say, well, go get a fossilised one, you'd be right. But you can polish just about anything, plastic, stone, uh, timber, you know. Um, Scotland, how are you? And um, once I figured out, okay, I've probably got half the tools I need. They're not the diamond quality, proper industry tools, but between my sanding block <laughs> and a few of my little bits of saws and that, that I could adapt with different blades and just, yeah, got by, I started getting right back into it. And that was about, uh, it's coming up to 20 years ago anyway. Um, about 17, 18 years ago. Um, bit of a life back then. That completely disappeared. I uh, got broken into and all my stuff went missing. So it's taken me a bit longer till about six, seven years ago when I finally decided, yeah, I'll get back into it. And so, 
here I am back into it. And a lot of what I'm picking up, I will admit, you have, you know, you take your cues from other people. There's, um, you know, Justin, there's Roy, uh, uh, Pulitzer, and they're just, just to name the obvious ones. Um, but a little bit here, a little bit there, and I'm always learning. I like to think I'm never wrong, but I'll stand corrected at any time. And that way, once I stand corrected, I'm right again. So I'm never wrong. <laughs> but I'm always learning. I'm always finding out new things um, and trying to make sense of it. Sometimes other stuff contradicts stuff you used to know. And until it makes sense, you don't understand it. So sometimes I just research. Um, I'm pretty fascinated with the stuff, so I don't mind doing a bit of homework on it. Yeah. Ah, that's life though, Stephen. Yeah, I'm sure I'm not the first person and I'm, you know, lucky that I wasn't home. Probably things could have been worse. Don't know who for, but... <laughs> um, but yeah, so a lot of what I'm learning is self-taught or uh, picked up from other industries and just correlated. Um, just going to turn this water up a bit again. So yeah, it's a, a bit of a lifetime of accumulated knowledge and practice and the more you get on the wheel, it's like a, learning to walk. You don't concentrate on it anymore. Muscle memory took over and you just think and go do things and next thing you know, your legs are taking you there. You practice enough on the wheel, as soon as you pick up a stone, next thing you know, you're halfway through cutting it, like walking anywhere. You know, you just, muscle memory kicks in. Uh, the hardest part about opal cutting is when you're not cutting traditional standard cabs that are oval and domed and when you get to free form and carving it takes a lot longer and a lot more um, decision making on which way should I go about it like this one for instance I do think it's a triangle but that there's where the color stops so there's no color on this end so I could lose that and I'm still sitting here contemplating do I try and cut an oval out of it and what would I lose if I did so it's a kind of a constant thought process. You don't get complacent or you end up looking after, at your work afterwards and go, why didn't I do that differently? Uh, and sometimes it's so obvious, but I can admit you get a bit zoned out when you're doing quite a few and you don't pay attention too much because they're sort of pretty stock standard, you think. And then there's that one that you look back and go, mm, oh, I could have done better. If only had I done this or that. So I'm sort of studying this one. That's why I'm turning it around and playing with it. Um, thinking, where's the best oval? But I think I might leave it as a triangle because, yeah, I can still take a bit off this end. evens it up a bit so I'll leave that to the stick now doesn't need to be that thick there we go um, here's one I'm keen to see what's going to happen with I might start tidying this up as you can see all the colour in under here all right. see this colour bar travels right in under there. Not, not a problem. Um, comes out here. So it goes all over the place, but as I say, there's fractures in this. This is the meant to be the material. So I'm going to clean it up and have a bit of a study further on and see what is the best choice. If there's any sections in there that are like uh, fracture free. Oh, good morning, Jeff. How are you? Yeah, fracture's free. I'm gonna um, try and get a stone. Might have to slice it up a bit better. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You can polish water for sure, yeah. Um, that's how those ice sculptors get a nice finish on their stuff after they finish chipping away at it. 
yeah, the internal fractures for sure. Um, I keep leaving my light inside. I'm also used to using my camera light even when I'm cutting. I've got the camera on while I'm filming and I've got the light on, but I can't switch it on during a live. And so I usually have my camera light here and I just sit here like this and I can see everything up close and everything. But yeah, at the moment, I'm relying on a separate light source. So it's making it a bit difficult. But I'll take this here off and see how good this looks underneath. I'm just, I love looking at it in the rough and dreaming. So I can see all that color in under there playing around. Anyway, stop playing. <laughs> Of sand there. Uh, my dad, I've taught to cut opal. He's still learning, but he's done quite a fantastic job on the ones he's done. Don't get me wrong. Um, I just help him with dopping and stuff like that. But yeah, no, he's, I've taught him to cut opal. <laughs> he taught me how to drive trucks. Yeah, right. So you're off and racing now, Aunt Antique. That's yeah, really good when you can network and get help from other people that can see that you're actually interested and go, yeah, oh, I've got a machine lying around you can use. Morning, Malcolm. Yeah, just taking the sand out of this piece. Hopefully it doesn't go too deep. I hate it when I have to push too hard because you just know the carrots are coming away. It's getting brighter. Oh, it's going to be a big sand blob in there, I think. lose this pretty much this whole edge. Oh, still goes. If we'll destroy it. Keep cleaning the top up. mixed up in there, those bars, twisting and twirling.
yeah, it's an idea on this one, I think. Um, could even turn this one into a carving, I suppose. <laughs> oh, I wish I lived closer to Roy. It'd be like, hey, Roy, coming over to drop this one to you. you <laughs> see what you can do with it. I'll keep rolling out what I can just to see where it's going. So I can leave that there for now and hope it doesn't go too far and may actually end up having to do a Dremel job on this actually because of that sand there and I don't know how under there how deep in it still goes I know it sort of goes up that way like the core just coming up and out and I suppose I could try and risk bringing it back to there but then we're shrinking the stone a fair bit but it may be a necessary evil Butterfingers. Yeah, there is a lot of nice colour in it. I suppose it's probably easier I point it out. So we've got one running through there, dot there, one there, all this stained coloured stuff, and then a line of dark sand that goes through there but I think that might be opalized and just that'll come out there but yeah we've got this here that 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 all under here I think I might slice it take it through there hang on where am I looking sorry through there and then see what can come with the bottom piece as well Yeah, I might save that for the saw. We'll go do that in a sec. Don't mind me, I'm just having a sip of coffee. Need to wake up a bit more. God, it's early. For a Sunday. Um, this is another one I'll be doing on the slicing machine. Take a slice out of there for that top. We might just neaten it up a bit. So this is a matrix. This has got crystal and matrix. As you can see, you got the crystal there. And swirled in amongst this sort of brownish coloured stuff. And you see the colour goes through it. Now the... Um, yeah, it certainly will. Um, this will all actually go really, really nice and dark. That won't. That'll stay like that, but be blended in amongst it with the rest of the colour. And they actually look quite good. I've got some of this stuff inside treated. Um, might even go get that out later and have a look at some opal opals. But yeah, so that one's going to get sliced. I'll leave that like that for now. Might even get a second stone, depending on what it behaves like under there. Uh, what do we got here? Done that one. Right, we'll do a couple of small crystals and see what they come up like. Oh, I got a little four inch saw and it's got a 0.2 mil blade. We'll go have a look at that in a sec.
Bits like this may end up good for a doublet too, if I just flatten that base out and then stick it down onto a bit of boulder stone, iron stone potch. Looks like it might end up a bit thin. See what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be a bit thin by the end of it. That'll go on my uh, doublet pile. It's going to look fantastic as a doublet. <laughs> yeah, it uh, happens more than I'd like to admit. The stones. Uh, that's why I've got a whole bunch of towels down here on the floor. That way if I drop any. Move the camera around, Phil. Yep, that'd be a nice little double, I think. <laughs> yeah, I have a pretty successful rate of finding the stones I drop. I think there might be maybe one or two little tiny bits. Yeah, we just gotten down to the second level at the uh, claim. Um, went through a, a little, you know, few metres, square metre patch of the top surface. Um, didn't find anything up there, but as I chew through that, I might as well go through two levels at once since they're both so close together. So we revealed the second layer um, level and uh, I'm going to chew through them both as I go next time. But I ran out of time last trip and had to come back to Adelaide. I don't know why I don't mind going to other people's, but I hate my own birthday for some reason. So anyway, I turned 46 uh, last week. That was another reason I had to come back to Adelaide. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd like to have been up there still digging away. It's a bit of a uh, hard um, decision since I don't have all my cutting equipment up there. Cheers. <laughs> um, since I don't have my cutting equipment up there and I like to cut, which is what led to the mining side of things, more so. Um, <laughs> thanks guys. Yeah, no, I intentionally um, don't say anything. It's part of my self-conscious self -conscious act <laughs> I've got going on. Yeah, tr trying to convince the family, <laughs> cheers Stephen, to uh, move uptown to Mooka. I'm like, they got schools up there, come on. But yeah, no, you can't take, can't take the kids away from their friends, I suppose. <laughs> come on, you'll make new ones. No, all right. So I'm Adelaide bound, um, torn between Adelaide and family, and, and Amuka and Opal. It is. Come on, sand, disappear. I might tackle the rest of that on the stick.
Yeah, I'll do that one a bit. I'll probably another doubler anyway. Um, I'm not getting these two bits out of the way. I'm meant to be. So this one's got a bar sitting on top of some darker clear potch. Yeah, sort of translucent. It's got a big wedge out the top here. So that may end up bringing it back. It can, it depends on how saturated with opal, because it's the opal that'll fluoresce, not the host rock the opal has saturated. So if you've got uh, a hard matrix, you'd probably have a, uh, like this sort of matrix, you'd have better of a chance of it, because it's a glassy type matrix, as opposed um, to the concrete, say. So I don't think this stuff is going to fluoresce. Um, it, it would depend on how strong your uh, UV is and how close you look at it as to see if you can see any of it fluoresce. So there's a, a bit of a difference to how glassy it is. But as glassy as this looks, it's still porous. Um, but this is, this is, oh, how could you put it? It's a hard matrix because it's got a lot more saturation in it. But it's also got the matrices, which mix of two rocks, matrix. Um, so this one's got more of the other rock and less of the opal. And so it won't fluoresce as much, if at all. So yeah, I keep hearing about the uh, black light and all that. And again, um, you, you need to have your opal exposed for the black light to pick it up. So if it's covered in you know, dirt and that, you're not going to see it unless it got broken. Oh, okay, Sandy, that's cool. Um, I'm going to have to try it out then. I should do that later tonight, actually. I've got a couple of black lights so I'm going to set up and wait till it goes dark. I'll bring out all my matrixes and see what does and doesn't. Um, with the matrix, treating it will always be the best. Yeah, uh, I use black oxide in the um, bonding agent that I use, the Araldite. Um, and I use ironstone, so that gives it a black back for the doublets. No, no, I'm at home at the moment. I had to come back. Um, I should be back up around Thursday, Friday, though. I'm hoping my star bond gets here before I go back up. I ordered a couple of containers of it. Are you up there at the moment, Sandy? Ah, that's you. I know you, don't I? <laughs> How are you? Yeah, Greg's kind of turned me on to that um, star bond uh, between um, him and Trish. So I'm going to be giving that a go. I've just got a couple of containers ordered. Just told me it's going to be there sometime before the 5th of October, and I'm thinking... But I bought it in Australia, it shouldn't take that long. So hopefully it gets here quicker. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to do the trick. So it might be a little rectangle cushion.
Richie. Ja. Spot. Chewing my stone away. That'll do. Uh, star bonds are resin not a glue as such um, I don't know if they do a glue that can be used for doublets but it's more for stabilizing your stone uh, it's an opal it's not the super brightest of color in it but there is color in that <laughs> if you can tell, well, I'll come up a bit better. Take that top down a bit more after. Ah, this one. This one I might actually slice. I'm gonna actually start doing some slicing now, actually. Get that one, that one. What was the other one there? So I might head over to the saw and start slicing some of this up so I can continue on. This one had a really nice flash on that face there. It's got that line through it. That's not the fracture line. That's actually just a separation line between bars. But it does have right up the top some fractures that come around through here. So I'm going to see if I can get a slice through there of that. No, not a problem, Jeff. Have a good day. Talk to you later. So yeah, we'll head over to the saw. And set you up over here. This is the little four inch saw and it's got like a little 0.2 mil thick blade, very thin. Watch your ears. Uh, apron on. So this one, I just want that top section off. So I'm going to come through there. Um, this is an Azito tile cutting saw, wet tile saw. 
So, um, Bunnings, <laughs> if you're in Australia. <coughs> All right. Here we go. Watch your ears. for a walk. Let's see what I've done. Ugh, keep my goggles off. There's that one. That's a bit, bit off. Okay, Scarlet. That's all right, I don't need money. <laughs> I've already got everything I need here. Now I've got you guys' attention, I'm fine. <laughs> so I'll cut a nice stone. Little one. That's the main one I wanted. Try and get rid of some of that crack. Bits like that are gonna come off it. I'm sure I'll get a small stone in there somewhere. Oops. Oh, about the uh, the lapel, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the offer. I did end up buying one, but yeah, it's not the best. So. I'll have to uh, buy a proper brand one that works with the iPhone 11. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's like uh, lining up the shot to hold your breath, keep it steady. <laughs> um, that may come off there. Might even get two stones out of this one, hey? If I cut it through there, I'll get one there and one down here. Yeah, this is the uh, meant to be stuff that the, um, they're just clearing a road. And next thing you know, they look back and this is all glistening in the sun. So they didn't plan on coming across it. But uh, yeah, put the blade straight through it. Oh, well. Um, put them over there. All right, turn the machine back on. Let me get out of this. Get a nice little oval out of that actually. Roll that corner out. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm just gonna turn the water up. Yeah, a bit of crystal, a bit of matrix, a bit of Minabi, Kuvapiti, and some Andamuka. Yeah, that's why I don't mind the Matrix because it may be, um, oh, how could you put it? Not regarded as highly as the rest of the Opals, but it comes in big pieces to play with. So, um, yeah, it can be uh, a lot of fun cutting some decent sized stones. Some that are about a hand size, handful size. it again or do I try and keep it all as one? So I'm gonna lose that if I keep it as one. I'll take this off anyway. See what happens then. Sorry guys. I'll narrow this end a bit. I'm going to commit to it now I've done it. Get a bit of a teardrop shape. I feel I can roll that bit out.
outside is much easier. Still got enough colour to go down more. Better. Of that out on a stick. Oh, apple tooth. <laughs> Made it into a bellum night pipe too. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I like to uh, close off the area I work in, that way it can't escape the region. Oh, just an apron, yeah. Honestly, uh, unless I'm at the club, I never used to use an apron. My wheels aren't spinning towards me, so I'm not getting flung with water, or water's being flung sideways into this shroud. Come back here a bit. So because the wheel spins this way, it's all just going sideways. Nothing comes at you. It's only when you put the stone against it. And if there's a you know, little line under there, ridge, it'll direct the water as it gets come out and it can squirt at you like it did a second ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't get wet with this thing. It's pretty cool. With the tile saw, that's another uh, kettle of fish. So I do need something for that. I uh, usually just tuck in a tea tower and collar. <laughs> All right, see what I can come up with out of this. I'll snap that straight off, would be good. Yeah, we'll grind it off instead. Gonna plug in some power for you guys so I don't cut out from lack of battery. Just gonna do it with my teeth. No, I've got help, I'm joking. <laughs> Yeah, big stones like this even, it's not super huge from what I've been handling, but it's bigger than your average couple of carrots. And it is a lot easier to manhandle without the stick into a stone.
Uh, the cutting discs. These. This is an all-in-one all from Gem Master. It's a uh, GSP8. It's sold by Gem Cuts over in Ballina, New South Wales. Um, so the machine, the wheels, the pads, the whole lot are just branded Gem Master, I suppose. Uh, the magnetic pads, I'll go through them in a little bit when I get to them. Um, but yeah, they're not actual Diamond Pacific or anything, or Novas or anything like that. They're just um, the wheels that come with the machine and the pads. You can buy the replacement ones as well, but I think they're yet again, they're just made by Gem Cuts, Gem Master specifically for this machine. So I assume the pads are their concoction as well. like they've been sprayed on coated on the pads uh, pad on the moment is 260 and the first um, black pad that'll be 280 yeah no I swear by this thing I learned to cut on a flat vertical so I've never I mean, I, I can do it on those other wheels. It takes me a bit, you know, muscle memory, different movements. Curved wheel, flat wheel, wheel spinning around that way, wheel spinning that way. A, the dynamics will change. And as much as I can cut on those wheels, my muscle memory is set to these. Um, no, nah, Matrix doesn't always get treated. Um, some matrix I'll see if I can pull some out later to show you it just doesn't need a treat it's pretty bright on its own but when the host rock um, takes over too much it diffuses the light and stops the um, Play a colour as such, so you sort of got to seal it or treat it to polish it to get the colour to come out. Yeah, so from this wheel, which is 260, it actually does go straight on to, uh, is it 280? Yeah, so 260. And then to get it on a soft pad, it just skips straight to 280, which is 20 grit difference. But then it goes to 600, 1200, 3000. And then I go to Serum if it's not Matrix. I don't put Matrix on the Serum. It doesn't like it. See how there's a ridge under there? The offset side so when I put that up against it it's directing the water like that it's about the only time I get sprayed the summer coming up I'm not going to complain so it's got a crack through there you have to deal with I was getting a nice shape on that too you know what? Uh, we haven't got any opal out the mine yet, but from that area you do get matrix, um, more so. Um, I'm hoping to get some crystalline amongst it. Yeah, there's a difference between hardness and strength though. So, I can smash a diamond with a hammer, not a problem. It's not tough, it's just hard. Um, whereas you've got gypsum, it's two on a um, Mohs scale, and you try and put an excavator bucket through that, <laughs> it's pretty hard stuff. Um, for something that's only soft, it's very strong. And yeah, 
I don't know if I'd want to chew my food up with something that could potentially become broken glass. I'd resin coat it maybe and then yeah, good to go. Well, that shrunk considerably. Still gonna have to shrink a bit more by, by the end of it. Alright, time to do some dopping. Unplug that. Focus on this so you don't get dizzy while I walk around. <laughs> screen yeah that'd be an expensive tooth to break Get myself sorted. Start drying these stones off, I suppose. Now, I probably won't be cutting all these right now. Um, I'll just pick a couple of nice ones out. I'll definitely be doing these two. Well, that one. Um, what else? Mm, we'll do that one. That one, one of those. Mm. Yeah, and that one. So five stones. Ooh, give me something to do without dragging this too long. So yeah, you get to see how I dot now. Okay, Trish. Yeah, Greg, um, slow levels. Um, I'm not, how can I put it? I don't have something I want to sell. I love to sell, but I'm not that kind of a salesman. Um, by the time I have to go through all the effort, it, it seems to take too much time away from me playing with Opal. I need help with this, to be honest, to sell. Um, just to be able to list it all. I can get all the photos done and that, but yeah, it's the time consuming internet side of things that I'm. Uh, struggling to how can you put it master i um try to take the photos got to load it through my ipad so i got to send it from my phone to my ipad and then this silly program that runs on the uh, website makes me then have to load from my ipads to the um, website's memory and then from the website to the actual um listing and so there's like just just for one listing it's, it's like i need to do this quicker somehow but i'm too stupid technologically so uh <laughs> i'm kind of a uh, at the pace i am but yeah no i do make sales a lot of the stuff i'm sort of mostly through uh emails so like now i've sort of done, done the uh put myself out there a bit people sort of got to know who i am and 
just reach out through the email. Seems a bit easier that way. Uh, you know, if I've got what I've got in the store, you've seen it. If you want something else or anything you've seen in one of the videos and I've still got it, just send us an email. It's probably the easiest thing. I'm going a bit too fast to be able to even concentrate um, and remember every single thing I've got and done. And so some of the stones I'm sort of just got put away and I'm like getting back to them and it's like, oh, that's right, I cut that one. That was pretty cool. Why did I leave that? No good reason. I was just busy. Oh, okay. And then I've got to, yeah, slowly round a few up, which is something I do need to do at the moment so I can start pouring a little bit more money into the mining. Uh, let's make some sales. All right, so I might as well wait. go through this while I'm doing it too. What I do is just heating the wax up. Don't mind me, I've, it's cold here, so I use my cold fingers. It's not burning me. I don't get it that hot that it's gonna drip and whatnot, and I can handle a bit of heat, but I don't say do this to those who don't. You know, it could hurt if you're not ready for it. So you just a bit of heat in the uh, wax, bit of heat in the stone, because if you heat your wax as much as you want, but you're whacking on a cold stone, it's gonna form an instant skin type thing that will just peel straight off because of the cold shock. Um, it won't bond to the stone. So having a bit of heat in the stone's not a bad thing. Wind that up, turn the flame on a bit. I'm just sort of bouncing it to the flame. You know, you can pass your finger through a flame and not get burnt. You're sort of doing that until you get it warmed up. Bit of heat in the uh, wax. And here I'm just sealing around the uh, the top there where I've pushed it up to meet. Yeah, I've got to sit down and I, I like to call it sitting down with my girls and have a photo shoot, <laughs> my opals. Uh, just make a day of it and um, muck around till you get the hang of... Um, getting the photos to, sorry, the opals to show color in the photos, because it can be very hard. It doesn't like being photographed. Um, one of the things that opal doesn't get, I think I've mentioned this once before, doesn't get uh, treated like other gemstones as far as promotion in sales. So they can't actually commercially do it. You can commercially mine most other things. I, you find a deposit, buy up the, you know, the lease and you keep mining and you've got guaranteed stock down there. One's pretty much next to the other. But an opal is just so different from one stone to the next and the guarantee of finding this and another one next to it isn't there. So the commercial, um, the commercial side of it just can't really take off as such because, uh, yeah, there's it's no guarantees in business. The other thing is with the photography, uh, a, it's hard to photograph, so when you photograph, they put it in the catalogue, someone goes, oh, I want that one, and they go get it, they bring it home, they go, hang on, because they're not holding on exactly that angle that it showed in the photo, it's going to show differently, and they go, is it the same one? And the other thing there is, well, if you can only photograph one opal that's going to look like that, and even then only on one angle it's going to look the way it did in the photo... How do you take a photo of one and see multiples? I mean, you can do that with diamonds because they all look the same. There's no difference, really, unless you start going for different colours and that. Yeah, I like to give a series of photos and a bit of video. So you, you, you take it. I like to go like, all right, we'll put the stone there. And then you go sort of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight photos full rotation with the light source in the same spot and that way as it's rotated people aren't going to 
you know, you have the light from this side when the stone's here and it shows great, and then you put the light over this side when you've flung it here and it looks great and it's a bit deceptive. Um, yeah, I haven't got a light box. Um, I find because going from black opal to white opal or translucent opal, the background's got to be different. Light blocks can be a bit bright sometimes for white opal. The same opal looks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter how many times you photograph it, it's just going to keep looking different. Um, which is why I like when I photograph, all my photos are actually a, um, a, a film because the video takes a better shot than the camera and then through filming, it's like you've taken a series of photos that you get to go back in afterwards. So I just press play, hit pause, scroll through to a moment where I go, yeah, I like that position there and then just screenshot it and that's my photos. Yeah, I've got thousands of photos of my opals. Um, should get going on this actually. Uh, lots and lots of photos. Uh, yeah, just keep putting them on the disc. One day it'll be like go through them all and probably make up a dictionary worth of them. Yeah, the the problem as well as what everyone always says is, oh, your screen, your screen's gonna make it look different to the you know screen that the settings on the the camera that were taken that has to be displayed on a, a screen with a certain settings to then replicate that um, true. Um, in the picture and so if someone's monitor or screen is a different brand even and it uses slightly different settings or whatever it's just going to put the photo out from the intended visual that was taken in the original photo um, yeah there's just so many things wrong with opal personal sales always the best like when you can come in and see it but at any given moment I like to um you know, be contactable and say, all right, yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll go grab it and take some more photos of you right now for, uh, for of it right now for you. G'day, Andy. Ah, uh, yeah, I've probably got a few. Um, you, you've, you find that you've got one and then next thing you know, you're like, oh, but I like this one now. And it's like, well, it's not like I don't like the other one, so I guess I've got two favourites now, and then three, and then four. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd have to really go through my collection again and, and find out my absolute favourite, which I should probably do. Um, I have a couple in mind. A um, couple of them, I must admit, yep, Black Opal, always nice. Uh, one was actually a recent one I cut, which is an Andamooka Black Opal. That's one of my new favourites. I think I might make a ring for myself out of that one. Uh, uh, then I got some specimen type bits, so they're not actual cut stones, but damn, they're pretty. Um, yet to be cut. So I'm slightly off camera here. screen in so yeah just trying to get this sitting straight don't mind the burn marks so if I get this one on reasonably central as it's going to be round it helps with rounding it so I can just sit there and fix my fingers in one position sit there and turn and it and it should just go round not around it should turn out to be round <laughs> right stick for the right job yep good night malcolm thanks for being here i'll um hopefully have these done before lunch <laughs> Uh, I learnt to cut in around about 1992. Um, 
how long have I been confidently cutting? Uh, probably about 15 years. As far as, you know, cutting and going, yeah, I could sell this and let somebody else look at my work. <laughs> Otherwise, as you probably all get to that stage, it's like you get an opal, you can't afford it thick and fast, so you get one, it's my favourite one, so I don't want to sell it. And you look at everyone else, everything else and go, oh, but they look, they look horrible compared to this one. I can't sell them either. And so you kind of get stuck with your collection until you build it up and build it up and build it up and go, right, I think I can pass with some bits. So yeah, 1992, I learned to cut. Um, but yeah, getting stuck into it like I have been, um, I think it's one of those things when you're young, starting a family, you don't really have the spare cash to just go blow on a few pretty stones. Cutting came first, then jewelry making. Um, so I started cutting and enjoyed it and I was selling lots of stones. Um, I was Phil M162, uh, yeah, Phil M162 on eBay for a while there. 100% um, happy customers, but I never got to see the end results of what was happening to my stones. It's like, you, you go through all the effort. I think it's like foster um, situations where you always wonder what happened to those kids. Where are they now? <laughs> it's kind of the same with my opals. I never got to see what they turned into, rings or pens or what. So, um, yeah, started silversmithing, which is something I'd planned on doing pretty much anyway. And then it came to the point where it's like, all right, why is this opal I keep buying fractured, broken, chipped? Surely that... These miners must be doing something wrong when they're pulling it out the ground. I'm going to go and sort it out myself. <laughs> oh, tell God your plans if you want to make him laugh. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've mined and not been as successful enough to go, all right, now I'm going to pull this chunk out the ground unbroken. I haven't come across that yet, but I can see how it happens now. It's a case of you're just digging. Next thing you know, you've put your tool through it. And um, that's that. Now it's a broken piece and you make the best of it. Um, those who mine larger scale that take the dirt up and dig it and then run it through a machine and it gets less damage that way, like through the tumblers and that. All right. Um, well, I've got heaps of stones. If you want to look at stones, I've cut. <laughs> As I say, I'll probably continue this on for this afternoon and sit here and do a carving because I've got a belemnite pipe um, from Andamuka that I want to get to. Um, I'm running out of sticks here. Um, so I'll do a carving, but I'll pull out some of my collection as well and yeah, flash some stones around if anyone's interested in them. Let me know in a comment or something. And, um, yeah, or send me an email. My pricing is usually, um, I like to keep it under what they're worth, i.e. wholesale-ish, somewhere between wholesale. I mean, if I just selling a stone is in, there's, you, you gotta leave the meat on the bone for the next person, I like to call it. I like meat on the bone when I get it, so I like to leave meat on the bone because I know other people will like it. Plus, you want repeated sales, you've got to sell quality and part with stuff. And you can't expect everybody to pay top-end retail when they're trying to do something with it and make money off it themselves. So especially when I was doing, just cutting the stones and letting other people do it. <laughs> yeah. The uh, critters pretty much keep to themselves. I've sort of, um, you know, you're driving along, you see the lizards and stuff like that. I think I, uh, I learned from a farmer back in the day where I used to work up on a farm and he had a really good eye for driving along and spotting lizards and snakes and stuff. And next thing you know, you'd be rolling down the road with the handbrake on minus your driver. He was chasing a lizard off the side of the road while you're driving along. Yay. Um, he was very quick. 
and sort of, yeah, so I sort of learned, yeah, you sort of spot them, get on the brakes, keep your eye on them, try not to have an accident, <laughs> get your camera ready. So, yeah, you're not just stumbling off across them left, right and centre or anything. And, yeah, the mining I'm not going to take too seriously. I do have another job. I, um, you know, I'll take it seriously once it comes thick and fast, but I'm not going to sit there and go, oh, no, I can't feed the kids. I didn't find any opal. So, you know, that's, that's the risk I won't take there. And, uh, one more stick. Yeah, I like to, like to keep funded. Um, the other thing is, yeah, doing this, a lot of things in life is like, well, what are you working for? What are you doing anything you do for? Um, when, once you've got a certain, uh, what do you call it, um, stability on your house, home life, and you go, well, what would I be doing if I wanted to work and go on holiday? <laughs> I'd go to Andamooka. So um, literally, I'm living the dream, I could say. Um, mining will pay for itself when I find something. There's uh, those who like to take it very seriously and bring out the big guns and go mining, but then, you know, that's going to cost big money in fuel and expenses and breakdowns, and I don't have that kind of money yet. I haven't found enough opal. But, yeah, it's kind of a... Uh, I don't even think most miners... How could you put it? Probably wouldn't know what to do with themselves if they found the money. They'd just go dig a bigger hole, you know? <laughs> it's it's the thrill of, like they say, pursuit of happiness. Happiness is in the pursuit. And I think I'm having enough fun looking for the stuff. Clearly, you don't just want to go out and dig and find absolutely nothing, as if you're wondering, does the stuff even exist? But I'm in the right spot. I'm in the right area, and it keeps the, uh, the excitement up while you're out there, just thinking the possibilities of if I could. And people do find something decent. But unless you're going to go looking for new ground, you're not going to find the old ground, the big deposits, because they're already gone. We're going through the scraps, I suppose. Yeah, that was a pretty good episode. I'll do what? Opal Hunters. They're up at Andamooka, by the way. Um, so I assume that they're going to have... Uh, what, I know one, if not a couple of, yeah, Andamookans on that next series when it comes out next year, I think. Season six or seven. Seven, I think. Um, yeah. I've tried to leave them alone a bit up there. I thought, nah. <laughs> Better not film them. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's reality TV. Just remember, so it's it's all happening, one way or another. Um, but of course they put the story to it. Mine's probably going to be different to the way that you see it going on um, Andamooka. Uh, sorry, on Outback Opal, Opal Hunters, because they'll uh, shoot the whole season get it all edited and ready to go, and then you've got, like, you know, reality TV. You've got your storyline to follow. Whereas mine, it's like, uh, well, we're going mining, and there's the ground, and now I'm digging. <laughs> and everyone's just going to keep asking, did you find anything? And I'll be like, no, not yet, until I do. Um, and if I don't find anything, you're not going to get that end of the season. Oh, they came good and found their $50,000 worth. Uh, I've got about a ten to $20,000 target this year season at the moment just so i can have a couple of bucks to afford what we've done and i also need to get a skid steer or a bobcat so let's shuffle a bit of dirt around yes you certainly can just watch out for the holes you sort of want to be a bit familiar during the day with the area you're probably going to fossick so you know how to get out there without driving into a hole and then falling in one because you got disorientated spinning around looking in the dark for dirt in the dirt in the dark for opal with a black light, not proper light. So it's, yeah, it, it's, you know, like anything, just pay attention to what you do. It's not that dangerous, but it is.
Um, but yeah, no, you, you most certainly can. Uh, you got to think. Hey, Matrix was considered rubbish. Simple. They came across the Matrix. They'd go, damn it, let's go dig somewhere else and find the crystal. And probably throw half that stuff away. It's probably sitting at the bottom of a bunch of mullock heaps because it was just either missed because people didn't know what it was. And unless you literally got it there, wet it, look at it. Oh, yes, there is a bit of colour. Um, back in the day where they're sitting there with a candle and whatever and in the heat and ha not even half the mod cons you have these days to go, yeah, it's tolerable up there with the heat and the flies and the, you know, you got cold drinks, you got food when you want, you got shelter, you, you know, you've got electricity. But back then it was, you know, let's get in, let's go hard, let's find the reds and let's get out and that's it. Um, anything else back then wasn't worth the money it's now worth. Um, including Matrix. So, yeah, it's not like there's the piles where that miner was when back in the day they were discarding it, so there's the pile to go through. I'm sure a bit of local knowledge may have an idea of some sort of spots like that, but I'm sure they've already been picked clean anyway. <laughs> My precious. Yeah. Yeah, now finding the big one, sometimes you can just dig and dig and dig and then you find that big one and that was it on the whole claim. Whether you missed if there was anything else there, whether you didn't dig deep enough to find out or whatever the reasons are, you get in, you dig, you find what you find and that's it. And some people, the, the, uh, the Black Hand um, Museum mine up in Lightning Ridge. And the fella's story there is he went there, mined, found nothing. Ended up with a bunch of tunnels and networks that went everywhere and a bit of debt. And what else can you do? So he started carving figurines and everything throughout the walls and painting them up. And now it's a museum of carvings. It looks really cool. If you ever up Lightning Ridgeway, um, Museum of the Black Hand, or the Black Hand Museum, something. So yeah, I'm going to head over to the wheel and start cutting away. Ugh. Water's on. Watch your ears. So I'll start with this one. See that bar. This one I'm just trying to get round, so I'm letting it hit all the high points. <laughs> not a problem. Um, I'm not offended if you, you know, this is probably going to maybe even go on for a bit, this live stream. So, you know, you're welcome back. Go do something else for a bit if anyone's vaguing out a bit. Otherwise, yeah, I'll, uh, I don't know, keep you around for the day. <laughs> As I say, I'll be out here doing this sort of thing anyway, and it's not really much to leave the camera going. Oh, for sure. All that we're waiting for is for people to go out, do some, you know, exploratory drilling and 
find those new areas. There's definitely ones that have already been discovered. People have sort of gone, you know what, I know the opal's there, it's a bit expensive to go out there and get it. But, you know, back in the day when they were mining, they never thought that we'd have the affordability of the excavators and stuff we have today. Um, and you don't know what we're gonna have in mining tomorrow. So these areas are just waiting for the right time um, in technology, I suppose, in some ways, to be able to safely get it or reach it. Um, but yes, there is most definitely plenty of opal undiscovered. Um, but like Andrew can keep eating main fields, you, you're in a big, massive deposit of. But there are other deposits for sure. Uh, again, if anyone wants to spend a few bucks, go out there, grab a drill, pitch some claims, drill the claims, risk finding or not finding something and just keep looking then by all means there's yeah every opportunity out there but if you finally get out there boots on the ground look at the scale of the place and go well what's this little four six inch drill going to discover anyway <laughs> so you sort of you start off small and then realize how small you really are because you go in with the hand tools and go, yep, got my ground, it's only a 50 by 50. And it doesn't sound much, but that's quite a bit if you haven't got machinery. Does it perform from dry? So, from what I understand, the water became so acidic um, after receding, and the concentration of the acids in there was enough to dissolve, dissolve. Uh, the um, silica and being in its fine little particles and rounded out and the silica rich waters that um, you can imagine a water table you know the, the seas and the tide at the beach well that happens underground too the water goes up and down and so over the years as the water went up and flooded into those you know it's receded down into an acidic nature and then it's floated back up with this silica gel. And then as it's receded again, as the gel goes in over a cavity and there's no way out from there, it can't flow back out again. And so what's trapped in there is trapped in there and the water goes up and down and fills it up. And that's where you get the multiple bars and that happening, I think, from those formations is from where a layer has gone in and then a layer has gone in and then you know it's flooded in time and time again and all these layers built up or it all goes all in at once and somehow that's just the result of it separating the uh, silica spheres into their arrangement. When you get all the uh, spheres big and small jumbled together, it doesn't reflect any specific color. But when you get the little silica spheres of the same size, you'll get that effect that produces the color. Again, I like Len Cram's um, explanation for the formation of opals. He can create it in a jar within minutes. Simple. He's got a solution that does the, uh, sorts out all the um, silica and all that by an iron exchange of some kind. And uh, yeah, Len Cram, Sunrise Opals or something like that. Um, I'll, I'll go through it a bit later. I'll pull the page up. But his explanation for how opal forms and the fact that he's a scientist growing opal in a shed, the only thing he hasn't done is be able to dehydrate it down to, a, um, you know, to re reduce all the water out um, to make it a solid. Otherwise, he's just stuck with that solution with the bars of colour forming, but it's all gooey in that. If you disturbed it, you'd wreck it. He hasn't figured out how to dehydrate the water back out yet. But the formation, the initial formation and colour happens very quick. You gotta love it when scientists contradict scientists. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's very, um, what's that word? It's like meditation. Yeah, I use my cork block. 
sometimes. Depends on um, how can it yes. Depends on the shape of the stain. Sometimes the pads don't work on flat faced as well, and so it's better off with just the cork pot, cork block, and grits. So I'm just starting to get the um, the height of where that curve is going to start from, and keeping that level all the way around. Because if this was set in a, if it gets set in a bezel, you want the bezel to to keep even and not waving around all the way. So I'm just getting that sorted out. Take it in an angle. I can start rocking away. <laughs> yeah, that's why I sort of haven't really done too many long videos as far as with the full amount of cutting. Um, it can put me to sleep, honestly. Unless you're actually doing it, sometimes you just can't watch. <laughs> it's almost as taxing to watch someone else work as it is to just do it yourself. I'm standing up. I've got a, um, well, I'm six foot, so having a nice tall bench, homemade bench helps. And so if I was sitting at a chair, I'd be down here somewhere looking up at my machine. Dome's coming up all right, almost to the middle. Yep, I think that's ready for the next pad. Yeah, 200,000 years at least. <laughs> All right, Kenneth, cheers. We'll probably still be on here sometime later this afternoon. Yeah, I think that one's, that one's done. Wanna be easy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I learned how to cut opal, and then those machines that are more common that you see now came out. And to me, never using one, I'm like, geez, they make it look so easy. Um, I reckon that'd be awesome. But as soon as I got one, I had trouble adapting after using this sort of method. For starters, as the wheel rotates, uh, where's it going, anti-clockwise. So it's coming up on this side, down on the other. Um, on, on this side, it's going up. On your wheels that rotate towards you on those machines, the rotation is down. So I'm going the opposite direction that most people cut on the wheel anyway. And because I'm right-handed, I go to this right side of the wheel, so I don't use my knuckles. If I was over here, I'd bang my knuckles more, so I can't use that side of the wheel unless I swap to left hand. I'm practicing on that. Um, yeah, it's just horses for courses and muscle memory. Doesn't like to, uh, can't teach an old dog new tricks type thing. Uh, moves faster further away from the center um, if you think about in the center and you've got a, a, a two inch radius around uh, circumference sorry it's only traveling per rotation two inches but for every two inches that inside of the wheel turns you've got like 20 inches out on the outside of the wheel all the way around so for every rotation the outside is moving it 20 inches per rotation speed and the other one's moving at a couple of inches rotation speed so the outside of the wheel is always faster it's like centrifugal force or as you think of it as the inside track and the outside track the outside track is always the longer route and if they're both doing a rotation every second then the outside track, you must be covering a lot more distance to get around, so it must be traveling faster. Yeah, these are only uh, 1300 bucks, something like that. Um, and I say only because it's not thousands like the other machines. And it is a gem master. And this is how opals had started to be cut back in the day with the cabbing. A lot of miners had this sort of a wheel, the uh, flat. Yeah, eBay's got a few good things. Other countries have always got different branded stuff. The only thing you need to watch out for is uh, power i.e. the difference between America and uh, Australia is like 120 volts, so like we're on 240, you guys are on 120. Which is pretty much why it would be hard, and I think that's why Gem Master don't ship so much overseas, um, unless you're a country that shares 240, otherwise the machines just won't work, or you won't have enough power running through your um, system to run it. Enough bang for your buck.
Yeah. Yeah, this one comes with everything you need. Um, all the pads, everything, all the way through to the 3000 grit. Just doesn't, well, it comes with cerium uh, and a buffing pad, but I like the leather for um, doing the cerium. Yeah, 1400 bucks, uh, Australian dollars that is. It's the GSP8. Uh, there's the four main pads, which is the 280, the 600, 1200 and 3000. And for a set of the four is 350 bucks for the whole four. Mind you, yes, they're probably not going to last as long as a diamond wheel does. Um, but unless you're in the industry, how many thousands of stones are you cutting that you're going to go through, you know, go through that many? If I was taking this more serious, and um, yeah, I can do that uh, when I hop off here. Um, Yeah, if, if I was to take this any more serious and go, all right, I'm going to cut lots and lots of stones, and then I look at this machine and go, wow, that wore out pretty quick, I might want to upgrade the quality of the machine. But for what I'm doing and the amount that I'm doing, and I do cut a fair bit, but I'm not sitting there literally day after day after day after day, and whether it's me or someone else, beating the hell out of the machine because you're on a deadline. You know, you've got the hourly rate. You've got to cut, 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 cut. Um, I wouldn't enjoy it doing that either. It's like just, just buy your road stock standard. You don't need a race car. They won't work on the roads anyway. Or the stone. Yeah, I'm still on the first set of pads I got with this machine. Can you cover the... And to see it glow. What did you want to see glow? Sorry, the stone. <laughs> Not sure what you meant. Yeah, I mean. Back when Shelley's Lapidary was still a thing, I uh, bought this. Um, oh, geez, that's got to be 15 odd years ago. And this is that bag still. That's how little I waste this stuff. You use just enough on each one to get the job done. You don't need it flying all over the place and flying off the wheel, trying to make sure the wheel's coated in a big, thick coating. You only need it you know, one layer thick, you know, very thin coating to get the job done. Um, adding extra powder doesn't make it polish better. It's it's serum. It just polishes it the rate it's going to polish. So that's lasted me very, very long. And here's the bag they gave me with the machine. I haven't even opened that yet. So I've got plenty of serum. Um, with the silversmithing also, I think... It was like five years ago when I bought my pickle solution. I made up a batch, mixed it up, and I think I've maybe put a teaspoon or two pickle to top up the strength and obviously a bit of water here and there. Um, other than that, that's the original pickle I've still got and it's still as strong as I need it. I'm literally not doing thousands of bits and going through a tub of a week. 
Yeah, steering wheel. Uh, all right, so these plates here that this is, this just unscrews off the wheel. So you can buy these plates and you can either have that on it, you can have, well, what I've got over there, one of those leather pads. Um, all you're really needing is uh, the, the fitting that goes on the back to fit it to the main that screws on. And then you attach that to any face plate you want. You could make your own if you wanted. Um, really all you need is the shroud, the machine, the setup with the, you know, it's got all the water attachment ready to go. These are the things that you don't have to do, but I think these pretty much, you can buy the shroud separately, the motor separately, everything you could, you could buy it in parts and put it together yourself. <laughs> yes, when I'm on the Dremel, for sure, I have to set up towels and everything. It goes everywhere. So I've just noticed got a little bit of that little nick in the side there. I'm going to have to get out. So this one's going to allow for a reasonably high dome. You can see that line. I'm trying to keep that even all the way around. Start getting the dome happening. This time might have a few too many issues. This is the one I was saying, it's got a bit too much splits through it. I'll just go down a bit further.
I reckon it'll come out. I think that got it. Sorry, yeah, um, this one's meant to be. Um, Cuba PD and America and meant to be. All in one hand and two more and America. Matrix and just white and black. I think that'll do for that one. And, uh, so I'll get it finished off. I might save these for a bit later or get them done. And uh, start getting onto the pads so I can explain some of this. So yeah, it's got the uh, magnetic system. It's all just magnets. Let's see if I can zoom back out. So, just to demonstrate, you hold the belt back here. My hand's going back here to hold the thing that spins it. Hold that and then... Should be able to... Undo it. I'm going to have to hold the back a bit tighter. But this thing should just unscrew off of there. And that's all you do to replace them. Um, then you can... <coughs> if I've only got the one machine... I could take the leather um, one I've got over there and just keep swapping them. Um, but yeah, I'm glad I've got them separate because it'd be a lot of hassle. This one is the base plate. So this is the 260. It comes with a 150 hard. It's still a pad, so it's just magnetic, you know. Goes on, stays there. When you're ready, take it off. That's as easy as changing a wheel is... You don't have to keep changing wheels. The only one you'll ever have to change is this when it runs out. Um, and then, yeah, you just go through the magnetic system each time, just keep them in order. Black, brown, gray, pink. 280, 600, 1200, 30, uh, 3000. And, um, yeah, very simple to use. Just make sure you line them up. I'm sure they'll go flying off if you don't. You set it off center. Make sure you've definitely got your water running though with these. Um, but there, yeah, it's very simple, that's it. And then off we go again. So this, it's kind of like when you if, you, if you're cutting stones and you know that you jump on your hard wheels, but you got to get out those little facet marks so you end up on like a sandpaper wheel pre-polish before you go on to the polish polish. This is kind of the benefits of going from the 280, uh, 260 to a 280 is the grit's not much different, but this one being softer and spongier is going to take away all your facet marks from the grit before without having to wear it too much because there's only 20 grit difference between this one and the one before. And then the other next ones, that they're all just pads it's all spongy and you don't get facet marks anymore. 
So it's just that one wheel you've got to cope with. Get all your facet marks out with this. This one you can sort of push in a little bit. You don't want to push too hard. Other, you know, pushing too hard is not going to cut extra. But you can just push into it. It's spongy, it rolls over the corners a lot more. It's harder with the sponginess to get flat tops in the center polish. They take a bit longer because the pad likes to hit the corner, bow a bit, and then come back onto this corner if you're pushing hard. And so it's lightly touching the center and it won't polish that center, but you get really nicely polished corners and then it starts rounding out. But if you just touch that center very softly without pushing in too hard, you can get it to touch that center at the top and it just takes a bit of time and it will come good. But other than that, yeah, this thing is a dream to use. In fact, if this is not considered a professional machine, I want one like this if I was to call it a professional machine. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, um, as good as any professional machine or those who claim to be professionals that have machines they claim are professional machines or industry machines. Um, just the $1,400 price tag in comparison to some, don't be fooled by it. It's not cheap, nasty. It's just as good. It's got the same sort of a motor as the rest of them have. Uh, but you're not turning six wheels at once just to use one. So I suppose your energy costs on this is a bit less. No. Um, you just got to get used to cutting on a flat lap. That's all, vertical flat. And it's not that hard. It really isn't. And I say that like, well, it shouldn't be hard to cut on the other wheels. Yet I have difficulty. No, I mean, other than the adapting to this machine from the other wheel machine, it's not hard to use. If you've never cut before and this is the only machine you'll ever know, you'll be right. So let's look at the surface, looking for any of the scratch marks that shouldn't be there, which there are in the center here. Should zoom back in. I think it's going to pick it up on the camera. There you go. And there's scratch marks in the middle. We get smooth around the edges. All the way around this edge is nice and polished, but the center's not. So as you wear your pads, it gets pretty smooth there, but you go to one of your um, lesser touch spots, like closer to the center or right on the outside, and it's got the right bits to. Yeah, it, it hits there really well. So it's getting a much better. All those scratches in the middle are sort of going. Any scratch marks in there from that pad, so that was good. Yeah, so I'll explain that. Some of them do. It's running fine. What it is, is if I flip this over, you see the way this magnetic is just a round cutout and they've just, you know, whack, whack, on they go. So if you follow this edge around, you'll get to here. And it's not on by much. And then if you look over this side, there's a bit more overhang. So it's, this pad is off center to the magnet. But as long as my magnet is centrally on there, 
and I watched that back edge there. Oh, you can't see that. Hang on. I watch this edge here and make sure it's on. So it's probably sitting a bit higher here. Goes down. But yeah, the wobble's nothing. As I say, it's a, a pad. So you sort of got this flex. You can push right into it. Um, it's a spray on coating. So when these come fresh, it is a bit rough. Uh, the smaller stones you'll notice more on, it'll be like a grrrr. You have to just ignore it. Ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Doesn't matter what it feels like the wheel's doing. Um, I think even Justin's explained that. People go, oh, when you put it on your Nova wheels, they sound really loud and coarse. And he's like, I can assure you they're not. It's the grit it is. It doesn't matter how bumpy it's put on here. It's 280 grit. It could put it with big lumps coming out. It's still a 280 grit. Um... It does make for a bit of a rough ride to start with. As I say, it smooths out. So this is the section, I don't know if you can tell, that I've been using more. It's gone a bit greyer. This is more black. But it's wearing out in this sort of a strip here. But it's fresh out here and it's fresh in the centre. Um, and you can probably hear it. It's a rough surface. But it's not rough. It's a soft, like spongy, you know. So bear with the bumps a bit um, and, and you don't have to push in thinking, oh, if I push hard enough, it'll stop bumping. It's like, no, nah, just hit, let it do it. It sounds wrong. It doesn't feel right either. Um, but when you look at the job when you're finished, it's job done. And that's all you need. It, it literally just does it. I don't know how, it doesn't feel right, doesn't sound right, but I've just learned to ignore it. Um, like if I rest that there, you see it bouncing like it's on a record jumping. And that's how, yeah, but if I push into the wheel, you can see my thumb slightly wobbling a bit. That's fine. I'm letting my thumb softly press against that so my thumb just wobbles with it. You just keep the, a, a set pressure on it. It doesn't matter what it does. It's, it's doing its job, not a problem. It just doesn't sound or feel right. But once you get used to it and know what it's doing, that sound and feel does feel right now. Because I know what it's doing, I know the result I'm gonna get, and I know that that's the sound and feel I've got to feel to get it. It's just this machine. Oh, there we go. There's a rarity. I fucking I talk too much. Stone got bored. Oh, repair job. I do find it helps better with that you make sure your bases are flat. So in case you're cutting and it does come off, you know you can get it back on flat again and straight. Um, nothing worse than a stone being offset. And um, you've now got to cut it on a different angle, especially when you're already onto the first pad. It's annoying. But no, that should be fine.
Yes, it does. There's the uh, skyish kind of blue in amongst. It's got dark and sky blue. Sky blue is the real blue I too do like though. Yeah, I've again I've only ever used wax. I never knew what I was doing. I went and did a laboratory course. They had wax. I've used wax, and I don't know anything else. Um, the wood glue stone combination is not good for glues. It glues wood and water for starters. The water swells. It splits, and it makes it very um, yeah, just deteriorates. I find the wax holds, you know, the moisture at bay from the being soaked into the timber, but the thinner the stick, the more you have the stone there and you're sort of pushing with your thumb there to get the pressure on. These thinner ones, and they're only bamboo ones, but these will just snap when they get too wet. Like they flex so much they don't even snap actually, it just bends and bends and bends like noodle, a soggy noodle. Andy. Hopefully that's that. Yep. All right, next pad. This is where I say rinse and repeat. It's just, now it's all the same motions, just going through the different pads. Just getting scratch marks out, the cutting part's done. It's just making it presentable now. Now you can hear the noise this wheel's giving off. It sounds rougher than the last one, but it's not. In fact, it's not even really bumping around as much. The other one was do 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 do. Yep, that one's the Mintaby. Round one's the Kuba PD. And the teardrop's the uh, Andamuka. Started off the live cleaning up a few more than this. Um, dropped a couple more that we just aren't going to get done in here quick enough. So yeah, I tried to keep one of each. Be sure to get all those marks out from the last pad. As long as the streaks all look uniform with each other, I'm pretty sure they're all off of this pad. So 
Yeah, it should be Saturday night there. Louisiana. Oh, seven thirty. Yeah, I think there's about a thirteen and a half hour difference between here and there, roughly. Depends what side of the states you're on. Sometimes some stones just don't want to play ball. Twice in a row. Hmm. I'll have to teach him a lesson in a minute. Clunk. Sorry about that. Just make sure I burn my fingers good and proper this time. Get it nice and hot. Suppose it is pretty glassy that side. It's sort of hard for the uh, wax to get stuck. That'll be the last time. Meeting up. All right. Third time lucky. Comes off again, it's staying off. <laughs> it happens more than we like to admit. It's worse when they go pating and just bounce and ricochet off God knows what, and then you're stuck trying to find it. And oh, when it misses the tower and hits the concrete, oh God, and you got to go back a couple of pads and. Uh, there's a little tiny little white chip mark. Yeah, this is why I've learnt, make sure you get your base right. If it does happen to come off, which it can, even twice, 
um, you can get it straight again not get stuck with all these different weird angles <laughs> so he's inside, I'd, I'd hunt for it with the vacuum. Marks. Uh, it'd have to be about two mil, if that, for the thinnest stone I've bezel set. Um, actually, I'll go pull that out later. I got one that's double-sided bezel set, and it is, it's about that big, and it's wide at the base, goes up in an odd shape, narrow up to the top, so it's odd shape, free-formed, undulating, carving, double-sided, Be bezel set <laughs> and that was just to set myself a challenge all right it's gonna go get this water dripping a bit better and repeat. Yeah. You've got to get the ratio right. After a certain width, you've got to have a certain thickness. So if you've got two mil, you probably wouldn't want any smaller than a um, 10 mil. No, sorry, any bigger than 10 mil. 10 mil by say seven mil oval at about two mil thick, if that. Oh yeah, no, we, we do what we do because we like what we do. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, no, that, that's not too bad. It's sort of getting the borderline. You might want a bit thickness for stability structural integrity. Don't get me wrong, I've got some in there that are probably that thin and bigger. Uh, more my collection pieces, I haven't tried setting yet. So this grey pad, this is where you start getting a decent enough pre-polish that you can go, all right, if you can see any scratch marks, go back a pad. Don't continue, because you will not get them out. Oh, come on, dry off. It's not too bad.
Yep, I'll go with that. And the better job you do on the pad before, the quicker the job on the next one. Not that you're trying to get it done fast, but it, it shouldn't take as long time-wise to do a few laps around the pad. Yeah, I'd drive the stone too, that's what I was doing like that. <laughs> um, okay, so the bezel. It's uh, the best way to explain it. Can you picture a straw as in a drinking straw? Now, picture a, a, a marble that fits perfectly down the center of that straw. One into the other, it goes in. If you even slightly crimp in one end, that ball can no longer fit either through it in either direction. So if you drop the ball down the straw and just slightly ever so slightly crimped in and made that exit hole smaller, the ball can't drop through. Same with a bezel and a stone. Once the stone goes in, all you need is just the slightest amount of closing on the stone and it cannot come back out that same hole. You shrunk the hole on it. So you just need enough bezel to just shrink it and just hug over it. Only just. It's a fine line between too much and, oops, went too far, now it's not enough and it won't close over at all. So you sort of just got to make sure you've got plenty of height on your bezel to start with, by which I mean at least half a mil to a mil. So when you look around it, when you look past the stone at the inside of the bezel sitting around it, you can see the bezel sits up over the stone, not down below the stone. Or the edge that you want it to set. If you have too much overhang, yeah, what happens is as you go to fold it in, you'll end up with more of that, um, how could you put it, like bunching up effect. Whereas if, if it just closes over, there's not enough to bunch up. But once you start going up too high and then forcing it in and over, um, it crimples up as in it, yeah, bunches up all the way around. And you don't want that effect, so that's where you've got to just bring the height down a bit. It's the same as if the stone was too small for the setting and you tried to close it. It'd have to bunch up around it to get closed over it.
Yeah, that's all. So yeah, I'll be able to show you how I go about the cerium too and why it lasts me so long. I want to go to do the polish in a sec. Just on the last 3,000 pad, 3,000 grit. Now I've been told when I learned, consider your cerium oxide as a 2,000 grit. I don't care what anyone else says, 14, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, just 2,000, simple. Why? I don't know why it gets a better um, polish than the 3,000. If it's a 2,000, doesn't make sense. But then why can you go from a 1,200 to a cerium and it's, it's perfect? So cerium's around the 2,000 mark. The more you use your cerium, the particle sizes are going to break down with every pass of the wheel past the stone. It's going to scratch the stones to, to give it those fine scratches that are a polish. But it's also going to break down. So the more you use that same cerium oxide, you may end up getting a finer and finer polish because it's breaking down as you're using it. So it may be a finer grit than 2,000. It may be a 14,000. But unless you've got it screen meshed at 14,000, the stuff that we're getting here for this is considered a 2,000. And anyone who argues that, tell them, then why does it work straight after the 1,200 grit? And you can't see any scratch marks that, you know, that as long as you've got all the marks out up to 1,200, the cerium oxide is the only step. I don't even need to do 3,000. It's a waste of time, really. I'm just doing it because force of habit. I don't know. In my head, I think it maybe gives it a better 3,000 down to the cerium. I don't know. Um, but it does look good. So, yeah, I'll get on with this and we'll get on with the polishing. Probably not that expensive. Depends what you call it expensive, I suppose. Um, again, a lot of the things you can double up. Like if you've already got a Dremel for carving, you can use a Dremel for all your uh, attachments for silversmithing as well. Yep. Yeah, silver's pretty cheap. I'm pretty wasteful when I use it. As far as, you know, I try and keep all the filings and everything, but I don't completely collect 100% of it. It's only a dollar a gram. Um, obviously, between one to two dollars if you've got it pre-shaped. Um, but yeah. I'd rather start with something like silver and work my way up to gold, which I'm yet to try gold. Apparently it's just the same as silver as far as working with it. Maybe a few few degrees higher temperature needed. But the equipment's the same. Um, again, if you've got the Dremel already, well, that's one power tool, hand tool you don't need. You just get the attachments for silver. 
if you use that sort of thing, like for engraving or for the split mandrel with the sandpaper on it, for polishing up your silver and that. Um, I suppose, again, a lot of the equipment I already had. Uh, so all I had to do is get a small set of files, a diamond, you know, one of the little saws, the thin saw. Um, you know, things like your solder. Um, I think, I'm, yeah, a mandrel was probably one of the best things you could use for the rings, making your rings and that. Uh, and just the little pliers and stuff like that. Again, I suppose it depends what you're actually specifically making as a, you know, if it's just a one-off thing for here or there. Um, the more technical you go, I'd even have to buy more tools. Some of the stuff I just wouldn't be able to achieve. Serum. So that piece I was using, you know, when you've got your, uh, hang on a sec, I'll grab it. All right. So what I'd done is had one of these. I'd used it and used it, wore it out, and then just grabbed some pliers and just crushed the rest of that stuff off of the mandrel itself. So you're basically just looking at that. Oh, hang on, that's the wrong bit. Ah. It's on the Dremel. So yeah, this bit you're talking about, I think. So that's just the center stalk. And then I just grabbed uh, silver smithing saw with its super fine blade. And just cut straight down the center of that just to cut the slot and then just feed your paper down it <laughs> yeah um, having flat pliers helps flat jaws without teeth um, I've seen it where you basically just get a file and <laughs> file your teeth away if you want. Uh, I bought mine specifically with flat jaws though. Gem cuts, again, gem cuts, that's where I go shopping. Um, you know, anything they haven't got, I'll go find somewhere else, but you know, just for safe sake, this, these guys, um, they sell these machines, they sell all the silversmithing tools, all my lapidary needs, the wax, the, the polish, you know, anything, attachments for Dremel, they got, yeah, if they haven't got it, they'd probably be able to get it for you. They've got budget, they've got expensive, they've got, you know, a bit of a range as well. It's not like you just go there and go, oh, it's so expensive. It's like, oh, you know what, just over 10 bucks for a pair of pliers, that's not too bad. They last and last. It's, you know, these are one-off costs. Don't look at it as something you've got to go out and buy the whole lot in one hit. Just grab the few things you're going to need. Get started, and you never buy them again. Uh, with gem cuts, unfortunately, I'm not sure if they don't post internationally or if they just don't post their machines internationally. As I was saying, with the machines, they're 240 volt here in Australia. 
may not be adaptable in the US, say, I think you run on 120 volt. So they, they don't sell for that reason. And that's the same as when we want to buy machines from you guys. Um, our, our power's too much. It'll overload the machine and burn it out, bang, gone. Um, I swear that's, you know, patent control. And the shape of the plug. I mean, I know you can get adaptions for the shape of a plug, but you can't for the uh, voltage put out. Well, not cheaply. It's something that steps it up or steps it down. That's enough of that. that. Come for a walk over here. Bumpy right here, sorry. where I basically just get your wheel wet make sure it's wet enough the cerium oxide sprays and I'll show you so the cerium oxide as it sprays off the wheel kind of sprays and stays down the right side here I try not to pick the cerium oxide up to put back on the wheel if I can help it I don't want to reuse my cerium at all just need that water so grab me stain dip me finger there's the camera give it a wipe over just to make sure it's wet shake all the excess off get me two in a cerium there that's what I want to use what I want to use is on my stone it's not flying all over my wheel Drop of water, sorry, drop of water on there just to mush that up a bit, make it slurry so it doesn't just fly off as dry powder when it hits the wheel. And you'll see the wheel get a pink strip go around it as I put this up against it. Like so. And now I'm just gonna use that. There's plenty there. I don't have to have it so thick on there that it's flying off the wheel. And that's why I get great polishes, but don't go through mycerium so often. When you feel the grit and the friction, you want to give it a bit more water. And that's when it starts washing the serum off of the pad. And if I need any more, I just give it a quick dunk put a bit more serum on it it doesn't take long as I took it to the 3000 grit That should be that. So again, rinse and repeat.
<laughs> and this is the worst part to have the stone come flying off your top stick. should be that. screen. And remove. <laughs> that one came off easy. Surprise, surprise. No, I didn't like it. It's got that chip there. Oh. Yeah, well, that was nature of the beast. It was a bit issue, this stuff, being the mint to be stuff that got smashed, so, uh, but why at the last minute? No, I don't know. Yeah, well, specimen looks the part. And zoom in a bit. Fantastic polish on it. I really miss the light on my camera at the moment. I'm going to use the other one. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a massive jar full of stuff for that. <laughs> Sort of coming up. It's a bit close to the light. They don't, uh, bugger. G'day, Riley. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was just their machinery that they don't, or if it was everything. Um, it's a bit of a shame because they got great product. So now we've got to do the backs. So what I might do is just one, 
to show you how I go about the backs and why it's important to tidy the backs up. Clean some stones. And if you don't know what you're looking at, you look at the backs and you just think, oh, it's the back, who cares? Um, or it's nicely polished, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a bit harder with the Dremel. But with the back, the importance of the back for me is I want this to sit in a setting that's going to be a nice, tight fit and it's going to sit in nice and snug. You can see the corner on here, on this side. Like it's rounded this side and it's a big corner there. That corner is an issue. If, and it's, you know, it shouldn't happen, but if you make a setting and the solder is a little bit flooded on the inside and gives it that roundness, you'll have a, a corner trying to sit in a round and it will never touch the bottom because of the little lip of solder. And so I'll always get rid of that edge, always. Because the amount of times I've gone and pushed a stone in and you just hear that little crunch of the bottom and you know, just know exactly what's just happened. And if you're unlucky, it can actually break through to the surface. So I always tidy that base edge up and make sure the base is flat. Now, it doesn't have to be flat, you say, because you might want it in an open back. But if I do it with a flat, I've got the option for whoever buys it can just open back or not, but it will sit flush and flat in this setting. And plus the base at the bottom will give it the, um, the right shape also if you have an open back. Yeah, now Roy gets a really good polish. It's it's a bit harder with the Dremel. Um, I think usually it depends on the shape of your bits. If you've got bits that are sort of um, like the bullet head, they don't really have much of a flat surface, and so you you constantly you've you just got to make sure you're moving it around as lot as much as possible with a smaller bit on a say a stone this size. Otherwise, the bit's just working that one spot. And then you get this uneven working over the surface, which doesn't give you that nice roll of a reflection. It gives you that little, 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 little sort of a dimply look. And it's also, I suppose this is where the quality of the bits come in, the Dremel bits. You get a little burr, is all I can describe it as, as a little bit that sticks up higher than the rest of the, uh, the bit in the grit. And it could be because of... Um, it wore away around it and left that little lug type thing. And then it leaves it, it doesn't matter how many times you go over it and go over it, every bit's getting done nicely by the whole head, except for that one bit that's leaving that one scratch line through it. Um, and that happens with the cheaper bits. And that's to do with the uh, the bonding agent, uh, a, a miss um, positioned wrong grit contamination in their cheaper setups. Um, you need the guarantees if you want to get a really, really good finish. So it, it, it is worth, as I say, some of the stuff is it's a one-off cost like the Dremel. I mean, yes, they will burn out in a few years. But, you know, for now it's a one-off cost. The bits, if you spend a little bit to get something decent, you will get a decent finish as long as you're not overpaying for cheap stuff and thinking it's expensive must be good. Um, there's a lot of forums, including Roy's, um, Riley, you, you, yeah, everyone's got some a pool of information on brands of machine to use or types of bits or what results you'll get from this and that. Uh, I suppose that's the benefit of these sorts of videos is you get a bit of feedback and you can build a bigger picture on what you think you should or shouldn't be using. Um, I've, I'll get these bits out and show you. And I've, I bought a bunch of them. They're not too bad. And they're all the colour systems, so I'll just get this one. Um, but they're the same as like the Nova tips. Now they're not too bad, as uh, long as you use them in the water. Um, otherwise they give off a bit of a smell and any amount of heat is just going to loosen that bonding agent that keeps the grit there and these just deteriorate very quickly. But you keep it in the water and it works just fine. Um, these ones... Again, it's how you use it. You know, they're saying the tradesman never blames his tools type thing. It's don't use the tool if you don't think it's right. 
but if you know how to use a tool that's not quite right, you can still make it work, if you know what I mean. And so I can make these work, but regardless of the finish I get with these, I still go over it with sandpaper. It just gets the... Um, it just gets a better finish. I can't explain it. It's just you do it, you see it, you see the results, and you just see, okay, they're the steps I need to take. Yeah, nah, Riley, your videos are awesome. And um, very informative. I still want to give a Cooking Matrix a go without the acid, but I'm a bit sort of nervous after, after I blew the last lot up. I can't explode them when I use acid, that's all I think. Um, <laughs> but I need to see a bit more detail on how you're going about it, like temperature setting and stuff like that. Because I keep hearing different things like don't get it over this amount and don't get it over that degrees. And I haven't figured all the finer details out yet. But yeah, keen to see that if anyone's... Otherwise, I'll just have to experiment myself one day. But I think I'll stick to the acid unless someone can show me a better way. I also learn by osmosis. I need to see it. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll send you an email. I'm definitely keen because, all right, there's something else I was going to show you. Um, let's see if I can get a, a light. I need yeah. another light. There we go. Let's come down here. I haven't switched these on this morning because I used the saw and I didn't want the water going in the acid. Um, let's see what I can do here. Just gotta put some PPE on. So yeah, this is the acid. show you what I can show you from here. I'm trying to get light on it, but this light's not very good. There we go. So yeah, that's cooking away in there. Can't get any of the face up the right way. But yeah, there are uh, Got to be turned on for today. I just leave them on during the day only. Um, make sure the water's in the pot around it. That way, as long as there's water there, I don't overheat the acid. So I'm just gonna neutralize my glove. It's just very time consuming. It takes me six days to go from the uh, pot over there, three days in that, then three days in here. And yeah, it is mucking around with acid, which I don't know, I'm, I'm one of those people that, acid and, <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you, you do want to be careful with this sort of thing if you're not, um, if, if you haven't worked with it before or frequently enough to understand the safety needs and what can go wrong and how easy it can go wrong and what you do on the in, in case, make sure you've got a big pot of bicarb ready to go. Just dick your, stick your head in if you have to. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a bit paranoid about it, but I, um, yeah, at least get 100% no cracked pieces <laughs> no overheating but um yeah no i definitely definitely wouldn't mind giving it a go i don't know what the missus is going to say i've taken too much out of the kitchen now i'm going to be moving into the kitchen she'll be like what get that outside but, but i just want to cook it you cook why can't i yeah anyway <laughs> 
So yeah, I'm gonna get this one on the dop stick and we'll go over and finish the back of that one, I reckon. And you do want to be careful. I don't just stick this straight on the heat and let it heat up till I think it's ready. Just bouncing it on and off, let it heat up. It'd be the same sort of idea as Riley when you're doing your um, put it in the sand first. I think you do to get the up to the uh, up to heat. You don't want to shock it and crack it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To get a hold of a couple extra crock pots. I've got already, yeah, I've brought a couple of dishes. Most of them I've taken back inside. Some of them I just hide. <laughs> I don't know where it is. I'm sorry, I don't know where it's gone. No, wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> and I use every spare jar we've got, either for storing opal or cooking opal in. So regardless of how flat my back is, I still got to make sure that it's that setting edge that I created around the top of the stone, which is upside down at the moment, and um, make sure that that's the part that's level across just in case my base was out and it's a bit wider one side than another. So always just make sure that I've got the right surface that I'm looking at and lining up. Should be it there. Yep. And uh, I don't know if you can see it here. Where I've got the um, wax coming up onto here. It continuously, you know, comes out from the stone and it doesn't come and in back into the stone and then the stone because that's where the water gets in. So I like to create that little lip seal all the way around. That's why I usually don't have a problem with the stone coming off the bottom, off the stick. Change bird, change plug. Give a sec, sorry guys. So the first thing I do is make sure I've got the um, the base flat because I know that that way up to the in relation to the stick that that top surface there is square. So now I can basically keep. As long as I keep my sticks pointed straight at the machine, it'll give it a nice flat bottom. And it's pretty flat, actually. So there wasn't much to do there. Still take it down a bit more, but I'll do that in a second. I'm going to deal with this outside edge corner. Now, I don't want to do it like a double-sided stone or anything i'm just going to be beveling the top and not down past a certain point otherwise you leave this top edge too thin
So as you can see, I've sort of given it a slight bevel and then gone in a bit more. Now it's just that center circle there with all that ugly stuff on it I've got to deal with. That's it. And I'll just give it a quick version of a polish, which should just be the black and gray. Kind of gives the illusion of it's polished, but it's not ever going to be really seen unless they open back. nice rounded base that when you sit it down the edges won't touch out so even if the corner of the inside of the bezel uh, the base plate and the bezel sides are square and have a little bit of a lip this will contour over that now and it will still sit flat I don't have to go too much effort to um, polish this up. So as I say, I'll skip the brown, just going from the, uh, basically from 280 to 1200. As I say, it's not really for presentation as such because it's not going to be seen, but it's more for the fact that this is going to go in a setting and you want it sliding in and out, no problems. No little chips or whatever's for it to you know, uh, catch on and no issues down the track. That can affect the um, integrity of the stain. Let me just take it back off. Find the easiest way there. It's just to heat the stone up. Heat the wax up and let the wax soak into a cloth. does get a bit hot for this portion of the process.
Vai lá. Job done. Ready to be set. Yeah, can do. Um, Middle Metho Spirits. Yeah. Now I've thought about doing that with the Dremel, but um, I think Roy's one that's pointed out when you get these shafts. Um, grab mine when you get these if i uh it, it does come with a kind of a stand you can attach it to your bench but the thing is you'd need the wheel to spin and then use it straight on because if you had a wheel here running this way and you would use it against here you're pushing against that shaft constantly you, you're gonna end up with a loose you know, you're putting too much strain on the bearing in a direction where it's supposed to be pushed not so much. And, yeah, you get wobble, flex. Um, and, yeah, probably damage your bit putting it off centre. So, depends how much time you've got. You've got plenty of time. You can hand sand the whole thing from start to finish. Um, I'm not saying how long it will hand sand anything and how much control you'll need and what shaped bits you'll need to get the right shapes but you could hand sand it nonetheless start to scratch um so with the dremel as long as you've got plenty of time you don't go putting too much pressure on it or using it in ways that probably isn't best to use it for longevity reasons as in you want your machine to last um i myself find when i use the dremel i like to have my hands fixed um well, I'll either have one hand, it has to be hard up against the bench, and then the Dremel just sits there, and then I've got precision control over it. Or I have to have my two hands touching, and that way it's, you know, you've got so much more control like this movement, rather than free floating around trying to balance it on top, and no, you just keep your hands together, it'll fix points from there. Yeah, yeah, as long as you've got time on your side, you're all right. Um, I'm going to – probably should end this here if I'm going to do one um, a bit later this afternoon. I do have carvings that I said I was going to get on with as well. Um, I wouldn't mind getting set up for. Uh, Blemnite pipe. That's really a nice one, crystally one. Should have brought it out. Um, but you see that this afternoon anyway. But, yeah, so – for cutting though, um, that's how I go about it. That's the reasoning I do the shapes I do, I, the way I fix the bottom up. Um, you gotta look at your opal too and how it can be cut. They all can't be cut in cabs and in shapes. Sometimes it's gotta be free form, sometimes the edge because of the bar won't allow for a straight bar, straight bezel. It'll have to undulate. Um, Pretty, oh, I'll bring it out a bit later. I'll, I'll prepare a bunch of stuff for this afternoon and I'll bring out some demonstration pieces, some of the pieces I've worked on in the past just to just, like the double-sided bezel thing I was talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep it all square and level. Yeah, no, no problem. I, um... I do want to do more of these. Every time I go to set up, it's like, oh, am I ready to do it? Am I not? And then it's like, oh, God, I don't know. I feel like I'm either not quite in the mood to put my mind towards it. Sometimes you like to come out and just go, I'm not going to think for the next two hours. I'm going to cut opal. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'd, I'd, I've been really trying to get onto this a lot more and 
I'm sure with time, these will just become a regular for me because muscle memory will set in and I'll just be hitting record. Anyway, hey, guys, we're back. We're doing something now. Cheers. Thanks, Riley. Much appreciated. Yeah. Um, I think if you've got to work in tandem with other people, i.e. a jeweler, you need to cut the way they're going to need you to cut. And I'm not saying jewelers, I'm not a jeweler, I'm just a silversmith, but you know, when it comes to industry, there's a reason this is shaped that way because this is going to be shaped that way and they're going to be paired up and they have to marry each other perfectly in shape. Whereas me, it's like, well, if I'm prepared to set it, I guess I can cut it however I want. But I do like to show that I can cut now and then. I don't, don't like wasting it. Um, which is why I went for a circle instead of a uh, oval. It just keeps retains the shape and the size, not for monetary reasons, just because it's opal. It's all worth something. It's a shame to waste some of it for reasons that aren't my logic. I I don't need oval to be happy with it. Whereas some people are like, well, if it's not oval, it's not opal. <laughs> um, it does, yeah. And again, with the, uh, the circle, you get to face it the, the way it's supposed to be. You can orientate it in any which way. It doesn't matter which way the setting's up. Oh, thanks, guys. And yeah, appreciate all the encouragement and comments and everything and the interactions I'm getting through doing this. It is amazing. Um, and I'm not just lightly saying that like, oh, yeah, it's so amazing. No, I mean, serious, like, this would probably be me just talking to myself a lot more nuttier if I just answered myself. <laughs> so it's good that you guys are here for this. And yeah, don't get me wrong, I still enjoy watching, like Roy, um, caught Pulitzer's last one last night as well. Um, you know, you're an opal addict, it's got a lo opal in it, you'll watch it. Oh, same here. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad I can contribute a little bit too, so it's been fun. Um, I'm trying to ignore that whole side of it, just go, yeah, just pretend you're talking to yourself out there, Phil, and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. Otherwise, yeah, I, I can't script this, so whatever comes out, comes out, and forgive me, or hope it turns out well. <laughs> so far, so good. Yep, no, no worries. Yeah, they'll, and, and again, Coop P.D. Opal, he's um, gifted me these. I'm, I'm really amazed. I'm really stoked. Thanks. I try not to use names, so I'm just going to keep calling you Cupidio Opal. But thanks, mate. I really appreciate this. Fantastic stuff. It's turned out great. Can't wait to set that one. And, um, yeah, his channel, if you like watching Opal Cut, is more focused straight on the Opal. And um, hopefully he'll branch out into other things like silversmithing or, you know, jewellery or something else um, one day. But he, he's young enough to... You know, the world's at his feet. I can't wait to see what happens for him. And he's young enough that you've got a whole life ahead of you to watch. Um, he'll be around for a while. And it'll be good in like 10, 20 years and all that to go, yep, you've come a long way. <laughs> you're doing well. And you're doing an amazing job so far, Coop Petey. Um, Coop Petey, well, that's your first name. Um, <laughs> Yeah, for, for, especially for your age, for your interest, for the things that everyone else is up to at your age and the fact that you've mastered what you've done um, with, with cutting so far is, well, you know, I, did I cut it? Did someone else cut it? It's like, yeah, if I want to say I've got good cuts, that's a fantastic cut then. And that was a pleasure to set. It was nice and even. You did a great job. And, yeah. Only too happy to promote him slightly. And he needs it. As soon as you find him, you'll be like, yeah, nice. Loving the opal. Keep it coming. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah, good stuff. Thanks. And, yeah, as much attention, I think it's the same for me as well, and I'm sure Roy and everyone else. The, the more that this sort of thing picks up, I'm sure the more that we're going to be able to do and show. Um, as I say, I'm going to let the uh, advert money tick over for a bit and in about six months we'll go and spend it on a parcel for a giveaway so you know all these things that this channel is bringing yeah is great it's 
more than just, hey, watch me cut opal, see you later, and that's it. It's, um, especially in these times of COVID, you don't get to go hang out with too many people and you can't go hang out at a club all the time and, and trying to find the people that are open-minded, interested in what you're interested in, and then bother to sit there and even interact with you while you're doing it is fantastic. So this is this has turned out great. And yeah, definitely we'll be doing a lot more. And I'll, yeah, back on this afternoon, I'll do a carving. So I might leave this one here or I'm gonna sit here and just keep flashing. <laughs> <laughs> this but i need to go get some breakfast or lunch or something i can't remember what time it is i know i got up early it? oh it's 11 o'clock so we've been doing this about four hours sorry guys <laughs> there goes half your day <laughs> um so yeah all right thanks for watching i'll come back on the salvo and hopefully you can join me or you'll just be able to maybe watch it later i'll just go into as much detail as i can while i do the carving and bit of a chat because um, it's more just sitting here so I'm less concentrated because I don't have to stand up for starters and um, yeah I'll bring some show and tell for you guys so hope you enjoyed thanks heaps and I'll catch you in a little while yeah it did <laughs> all right talk to you later